you could be the smartest person on the planet, but if you don't have the right mindset, if you don't think you're CISO material, if you truly believe that no one will hire you as a CISO, you're doomed. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, 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 and a few extra welcomes because it's always a pleasure to be with you. Dr. E is in the house. For those that are brand new, if this is your first time watching Life of a CISO with yours truly, welcome. And I have a question for you. Where have you been? We're like episode 100 plus, right? And, and, and you're just joining us now? You're late to the party, but don't worry. We got a cold beverage for you. Come on in. We're going to have a great time. For those of you that are frequent listeners, welcome back. I always appreciate spending some time with you. I hope you find a lot of value in what we're covering and presenting. Uh, one thing I do like to bring up is this is one way, right? I get to sit here and talk to you and give you information and data to help you be a world-class CISO. But unfortunately, you don't get to ask me questions. You, you don't get to interact. So one of the things we've started is this, these videos launch at 9 a.m. East Coast, every Thursday, and they're about 30 minutes. So the idea is that right at nine o'clock, you listen, and then at 9.30 on YouTube, just follow me on YouTube, Dr. Eric Cole, D-R-E-R-I-C-C-O-L-E, -E, and you'll see the announcements there. I go live for about 30, 45 minutes, and I interact with you. The entire purpose of the 930 YouTube Live is for me to interact with you and answer your questions. And it's awesome. I, I always intend to start off with a little story, but lately, because everyone knows first come, first serve, right? so if you want to get your questions answered, get them in early. At 929, we don't start till 930, the questions are coming already. So it typically is just an interaction Q&A. So if you have questions, if you need help, if you want some guidance, that is your opportunity for us to be able to interact and have some fun. So listen to these videos, but also join me live at 9.30 a.m. each week. Also, I'm big in giving out a lot of free content. You can listen to all my videos for free and you can become a world-class So It'll take you a while, but right? it's a long path, but you could get there. But if you're into acceleration, if you're into optimization, if you're into getting there quicker and faster, then we also have some paid programs. Our premier one is our CISO certification in which we go in and we do knowledge transfer, we do coaching, we do private peer group. We give you what I believe to be the three core components that are needed in order to be a world-class CISO. So if you're interested in that, you can just email me ecole at secure-anchor.com or click on any of the links or advertisements that are out there and we'd love to connect you, get you signed up and uh, have some fun right? Interact with you. We're actually doing one of my coaching calls this afternoon. So I'm um, recording a video today and then I get to do the coaching in the afternoon. It's an awesome day. And right? it doesn't get much better than this. To me, my team knows if I'm in a bad mood, which I very rarely happens. Well, at least I think that they probably think I get cranky um, more than I do. They're like, put Eric in front of the mic. But right? I heard my team the other day, uh, it was a pretty stressful day. There's a lot of stuff going on. And I heard one of the team members go, have Eric record some episodes, right? Because when this is in front of me, this comes out because th this is my mojo, right? This is my jam. Some people don't like teaching, presenting, uh, being in front of the camera to me. Was I was born to do it, right? I love it, I love it, I love it. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, those of you that are new, this is world class. So it might surprise you because in the beginning, I'm not talking directly about being a CISO. Yes, everything I cover applies to how you can become a world class CISO, but some of them are more mindset, life lessons and other areas that are secondary but needed and foundational to becoming world class. You could be the smartest person on the planet, but if you don't have the right mindset, if you don't think you're CISO material, 
if you truly believe that no one will hire you as a CISO, you're doomed. Now, the good part is I can fix you quickly. If you think you're a CISO, but you have no knowledge and no expertise, yeah, it'll probably take me a year or two because I got to teach you all the knowledge and expertise. But if you have the knowledge and expertise and you just have a little mindset issue, that could be like 10 minutes. I just got to, I got to tweak the operating system. I just have to apply a patch to your operating system to fix a little bug that's in it, right? So that's why I'm all about world-class. I'm all about you being the best you can possibly be. And that's why I cover all aspects. And I always like to start with a little story, a little antidote, a little mindset. And then the second half, we typically jump in to being world-class, specifically on the CISO front. But this is all about world-class, world-class, world-class. So I always say one of my favorite stories, but they're all my favorite stories. So I should just say one of my stories and you know that they're all my favorite because I love stories. I love teachings. I love ways of getting messages across in more subtle manners. So there was a physicist that was in school and he was taking a doctorate level physics course and he was just having one of those days where he was running very, very behind. He knew it was important to get the class. He knew class was a priority, but it was just one of those days. So he ended up showing up with five minutes left in class. And he shows up and he's, oh, okay, just, just regroup. You, you got this. And he looks on the board and there's three questions written on the board. Now, he's been in this class all semester. And one of the things this teacher does is as he teaches, he puts up homework. So by the end of the class, there's typically three homework questions on the board that you need to do and are due the following week. So he didn't bother asking anybody or checking. He just, okay, three questions on the board. They must be the homework. And he'll just have to read the book and figure out what's going on. So he wrote down those three questions and he leaves. And that weekend, he starts working on the homework for that physics class. And he starts looking at these questions and noticing they're a little harder than normal. Now, maybe the teacher's cranking it up a little and, and testing the students out. And he also noticed that these problems weren't in the book. But he was determined. He said, okay, must be homework. He must be testing us. So he says, I'm just going to apply all the different principles. I'm going to take all the different principles that I know as a physicist and I'm going to apply them to the problem. Now, it took a lot longer than he anticipated, so he was only able to complete one of the problems. The other two he wasn't able to complete. So he said, okay, I'm going to come clean. So he goes to the professor during the office hours and he goes, listen, I apologize for showing up late to class. It won't happen again, but I did get the homework. I showed up the last five minutes and I got the homework that was on the board, but I just wanted to let you know that I was only able to solve one of the homework assignments. The other two I wasn't able to solve, and I was wondering if I could have a little more time. Now, at this point, the professor has this weird look on his face, and he says, okay, give me the one that you solved. And as he's looking through it, the professor's like, what did you think those three questions were that were on the board? And he goes, the homework. Like you do every week, you give us homework. So I figured that was the homework that we needed to complete. And the professor starts laughing and he goes, no, if you came to class, you would have realized I said, because all of you are heavy into your dissertation and with midterms coming up, that I wasn't giving you homework this week. Those three problems that you saw on the board were three unsolvable problems in physics. I was trying to show you that in working on your dissertation, there are still unsolvable problems that you could take small portions of because the best minds in physics have not been able to solve these three problems in the last 50 years. And the student's like, and the professor starts laughing and he goes, I'm going to have to spend more time with this first problem. But I believe that in one weekend, you actually solved one of the problems because it looks like you actually came up with the correct answer and the correct proof. 
and you were actually able to solve this problem. Now, what's the lesson here? The only limitations of your mind are those that you put on it. Now, I firmly believe that if that student showed up at the beginning of class and heard what every other student heard, these are unsolvable problems. The best minds in physics who have worked on these problems for 50 years have not been able to solve them. They are truly unsolvable problems. He would have walked out saying they're unsolvable. He would not have spent time on them over the weekend and he would not have actually solved one of the problems because your mind believes what you tell it. So my question to you is this, how many solvable problems are there in your life that you're not solving because somebody told you they were unsolvable? Somebody told you they were too hard. It might be something as simple, and I see this all the time. In second, third, or fourth grade, somebody told you, you're not good in math, or you're not good at writing, or you're not good at public speaking. And your mind took that as factual data, created a belief, and you still believe that today. You still repeat that phrase where if you're at work or you're given a math problem, you will actually say, I am not good at math because of what somebody said. It amazes me of how many artificial limitations we put on our lives. And when those artificial limitations are removed, you are almost limitless in what you can do. I've seen different reports, so I'm not gonna quote them, but you see these reports that say anything that most people are using only between eight to 15% of their brain capacity. Think about that. You have a supercomputer available to you that can process and do anything and you're putting limitations on it and only allowing it to operate at 10 to 15% of its capability. That is crazy. But you know what those governors are? All those beliefs. All those things that people said are unsolvable. So what I love about this story is he was given a problem. He believed it was homework. He believed it was solvable. So what did he proceed to do? Solve it. Isn't that crazy? Something as simple as you believing that it's a solvable problem took something that nobody could solve for 50 years and a student, not even a doctor at that point, a student was able to solve it within a weekend. Isn't that crazy how powerful limiting beliefs are and how powerful when you remove and no longer believe those? Every one of those world-class physicists that couldn't solve this problem for 50 years, you know why? because they approached it saying, I can't solve it. They approached it saying, this is an unsolvable problem. That's what keeps things unsolvable because everyone believes it. It's not true, right? It's not factual, but, but it, it nonetheless is what happens. So question, I want you to spend some time today writing down what are some problems or areas in your life that if you believed were solvable, and you believe you could do, could change everything for you? Is there something you've been trying to learn? Is there something you're trying to do at work? Is it something involving learning business, learning how to do finances, being a world-class CISO? Because that is ultimately what's gonna be the difference between success and failure, my friends. It has nothing to do with how many books you read, it has nothing to do with how much knowledge you have. That's important. That's all foundational. But if you have a belief that you can't do something, if you have a belief that this is unsolvable, your mind says, okay, we're good. We're good. We're not going to even try. But if you can trick your mind. Now, the story I told you tricked but wasn't planned, right? The professor 
didn't realize he was tricking the student, and the student didn't realize he was being tricked. It was just a coincidence. But nonetheless, it worked, and he is now one of the most famous physicists on the planet because he tricked his mind. He inadvertently truly believed this was homework. He truly believed it was solvable, and therefore he was able to solve it. So I challenge you. There's nothing in your life that's impossible. There's nothing in your life that's unsolvable if you truly can believe and embrace it. And on that front, I truly believe every one of you is going to be, and you currently are, a world-class CISO. I always like to be careful with it because when I go in and say you are going to, that means you're not that person yet and you need to become it. I truly believe you are right now world-class CISO. My job is for you to remember who you are, is to remember that you are a bad you know what, right? I, 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 don't, I don't curse on my, on my uh, podcast, but I think you know what three-letter word uh, that, that, that I like to go there. You, 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 you are awesome. You are amazing. You are powerful. You just have to believe it. You just have to convince it. So what I always tell people with my coaching students one-on-one, -on -one, and I'll tell you is, you are currently sitting here right now today, a world-class CISO. My job is to just convince you, is to give you enough evidence to ask you enough questions to show you enough things that you start to believe it and you start to recognize it. You are that piece of marble where the statue of David is inside, all you need to do is remove the excess marble. Right? All you need to do is remove those excess limiting beliefs that are holding you back. And that beautiful, amazing world-class CISO that you are and destined to be will magically come out. So in being a world-class CISO, you need to be able to interact and work with the executive team. I would say right now, the number one issue that we see companies having with CISOs is they're not trusted by the executive team. The executives don't trust them for one of two reasons, and both are fixable. First, the previous CISO was too technical, didn't listen, didn't answer questions, and didn't speak their language. So they've basically got this negative connotation that we have to have a CISO because it's required by regulation because we're a publicly traded company, or we have to have a CISO to appease our customers or our board members and all those things. But I don't really trust them. I don't involve them in business decisions because they just can't communicate what I need. The second reason is you did that. You came in. You didn't know, no harm, no foul, but you thought CISO was a technical position and you showed up with technical slides and technical language and technical briefings and that's what you presented to the executives and they sat there going, I don't know what language you're speaking, but it's not ours. Right? You're speaking a language we don't understand. You're not answering the questions that we want and therefore we don't trust you. So trust right now is the biggest problem. How do you regain trust? You regain trust by going in and asking questions and proving yourself. So one of my favorite things to do is if you're in the position where you're not fully trusted and it's real simple, where do you sit? and who are in the meetings you attend? Do you sit in the executive wing? Because the executive wing is where the CEO, COO, CFO, Chief Legal Counsel, all those people sit. If you're not sitting there or you're in a different building, guess what? You're not trusted. Because if you were truly trusted and they wanted, they needed, they had to have your information, they would move your office. So one of the first indicators that I always look at is, where do you sit? Where do you physically sit? Now, with work from home and all that, right, it's a little different. So, so that one might 
not be as valuable as it used to be. So the next one is, how often do you meet with the executives? When was the last time you met with the CEO? When was the last time you met with the COO? When was the last time you met with the CFO? If you tell me a day ago or a few days ago, good. If you tell me months or years, not good. Because once again, if you are trusted and valuable, you talk to those people. People that trust and value my opinion call me on a regular basis. People that don't trust and value my opinion never, ever call me. What a shocker, right? So that's the next piece. Here's the real one. This is the real kicker. If you want to meet with the COO, CEO, if you want to meet with the CEO, COO, CFO, I'm getting too excited with all the C's. How long does it take to get that meeting set up? I will tell you right now with our clients that I have built a high level of trust with the executives. Not only do I have the CEO's cell phone number, I don't go through the EA, I don't send emails, I don't go through the normal chains. I text him or her directly. And if I text them and say, do you have a few minutes to talk? There's something important I need to go over with you. I will always get a call back within an hour. It's often within five minutes. With the ones that really, really trust me, I will get a call back immediately going, Eric, I was in the middle of a meeting, but I know you don't text me that often. And when you do, it's always critical what's going on. And then I better deliver because trust is one of those things. It takes a long time to build up and you can use it like that. I've had cases where I learned early in my career, it took me years to build up trust and I made one mistake, boom, the trust was gone and I had to rebuild from scratch. So you gotta be super careful and not abuse it. But that's the next one is, how long does it take you to set up a meeting? If you have to go through their EA and okay, he or she is really busy, so I can get you a meeting in about four weeks and then they reschedule it three times, you're not trusted. You're not trusted, you're not viewed as one of those core folks or individuals. If you go in and you send a invite saying there's something that's critical that I need to talk about and you get a meeting within an hour, a day, or a callback, you are trusted. So those are all indicators. The last one is when the executives meet, how often are you in those meetings? How often are you in a meeting, physical meeting or Zoom call, in which the CEO, COO, CFO, and chief legal counsel are all present? You're one of the core five. You're one of the five people at the table. If that never happens or hardly ever happens, once again, you're not trusted. So I've given you tests to determine how you're viewed in the organization and how trusted you are. Most, I never want to say all, but most CISOs don't do very well at the test. They're given the title, but they're not very trusted, which means you have work to do. How you build that trust. Start with open communication. Go in and send an email to them. If you can't get a meeting set up because you don't have the trust and it's gonna take six weeks, that's too long. So send an email saying, listen, I understand and recognize how critical cybersecurity is to the organization. And I've also recognized that I have not done a great job of communicating the information you need. What is one or two pieces of information that if I could provide to you would be valuable and have a positive impact on helping running and growing the business? And, and send them that question. Now, they might or might not reply. You might have to send it a few times. Right? You might get back a intermediate response from a gatekeeper. But the point is eventually it's going to get to them, they're going to read that and say, okay, this person is trying. Right? This person recognizes the need. Because let me tell you this, the executives need you. They need to get business level advice from somebody who understands cybersecurity. 
almost every executive will agree the number one concern to their business is cybersecurity. You know why? They have the least amount of experience. They have the least amount of decision making. And they don't have somebody trusted at the executive level that knows that. Operations isn't a concern because they've dealt with operational issues and they have a COO. Finances aren't a concern because they've dealt with that for so long and they have a CFO. Legal issues aren't a concern because they've dealt with that forever and they have a chief legal counsel. But cybersecurity is a concern because it's new. They don't have experience with it and they don't have somebody in that inner circle that understands and speaks the language at a business level. They need you, they want you, they have to have you, but you need to step up. You need to be a business executive. You need to stop being world-class security engineer, stop being technical. So here's some questions. Do you really know what business your organization is really in? I'm not talking at the superficial level. What I mean by that is, at a superficial level, you would say a hospital is in the healthcare business. At a superficial level, you would say that a financial organization is in the financial arena. But what I'm talking about is what differentiates your business from the competition? What really makes your business unique and different? Every company has unique differentiators. If you were exactly the same as everybody else, right? You, you either wouldn't go in business or you wouldn't be very profitable. So there's unique differentiators of what you do and how you operate. That's what I'm looking for. For example, one hospital chain that we work for, their whole premise and people drive two to three hours to go to this hospital because their premise is if you step in the ER you'll be seen by a doctor within 30 minutes. That's their business. That's the business they're in. So their business, yeah, superficially is healthcare. Their business is timely customer service. They're saying that, yes, you could go to any other hospital and you might have something minor and you might have to wait six hours. If you come into our ER, we will have a doctor, a doctor, see you within 30 minutes. That's the business they're really in. That's the business they really operate in. Why is that so important? Because if you don't know that and you come in as Mr. or Mrs. Cybersecurity Officer and you start saying, whoa, 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 whoa. We have unlocked terminals in the ER. Those must be locked down. Wait, doctors are using passwords. That's easy to guess. We need to set up two-factor multi-authentication with texting back to cell phones and blah, blah. And you put all this stuff in place that now makes it harder and more difficult for a patient who walks in the ER to get seen by a doctor in 30 minutes. You're, you're not going to be successful. You're going to be frustrated. Everyone around you is going to be frustrated. Nobody's going to think you understand what's going on. And you're either going to be demoted or asked to leave, or you're going to leave because you're so frustrated. This is why CISOs get themselves in so much trouble. And the, they come to me a lot going, Eric, it's so hard working in this organization because no one in the organization understands security. No one understands how important it is and that, yes, sometimes security has to be an inconvenience. And you know what I always say to that? Could it be that you don't understand the business? I asked them, how many people in the organization get frustrated with you? And they're like, oh, it's almost every business unit, every manager, every director, everyone I talk with is very, very frustrated with me because they say I don't understand. Yet it's they don't understand. So let's get this straight. Thousands of people are wrong and you are right. With love in my heart. I, you, you know, I care about you, right? Maybe... And it's not maybe, it is. You don't understand the business. And that's the problem. World-class security engineers do not need to understand the business. World-class 
chief information security officers do. So I urge you, spend time not trying to push your agenda, not trying to show how smart you are, not trying to make the organization secure, but spend some time understanding the business. Sit down with managers, directors, vice presidents, and executives and ask them, what are the things that I can do to help you? What are the most important things to the business? What differentiates us from our competition? What business are we really in? Because world-class CISOs understand the business first and use cybersecurity to help and enable what business they're in. Not so good crash and burn CISOs are those that only care about security, that don't care about the business, and whether they impact the business negatively or positively is irrelevant to them. Now, they might never say that, but that's what they're actually saying with their actions. So as we sort of wrap up this episode, remember, whether a problem is solvable or unsolvable is your decision. Start making more problems solvable. And to be a world-class CISO, understand the business. Enable the business and focus for the next three, six, nine, or 12 months, how do you build trust back? Because for you to be successful as a CISO, you have to be able to have the trust of the executives. And if you either lost it or is lost because of the actions of others, that must be your number one priority that you need to focus on. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Life of a CISO. We'll see you next week.